Good morning, everyone. I'm Bonnie Glazer. I'm director of the China Power Project and senior advisor uh, for Asia uh, here at the Center for Strategic and International uh, Studies. Uh, we never anticipate that we're going to have any uh, kind of a safety issue, but it is our standard practice here at CSIS to uh, tell you that I am your safety officer uh, if we do have any incidents, and I will be uh, letting you know where you go, but we are in the first floor. Um, there are some exits out this way and, of course, also out the front. Um, so we are going to talk today about the new southbound policy which many of you know is the flagship policy of uh, Taiwan's president, Tsai Ing-wen. And it is featured very prominently in the speeches that she has given going all the way back to her inauguration in May of 2016. And it was for that reason that we decided uh, to launch a, a project that would conduct an in-depth study of uh, the new southbound policy. So today, uh, we launch our report, and I hope that you've all gotten a copy. Uh, we've attempted to analyze the, the achievements. Uh, we have looked at some of the opportunities and challenges and made some policy recommendations going forward, both for the United States uh, and for Taiwan. So our program today will proceed uh, as follows. We're going to have short remarks by Taiwan's representative uh, to the United States. That will be followed by a keynote speech, which we will do via VTC for Minister uh, Without Portfolio, John Dung. And then we will have uh, some Q&A. We'll have a short break after that. And then we will have uh, a fellow from my program, Matthew Fanioli, who will be uh, summarizing the, a few of the key findings of our report very briefly. And then we're going to have a really excellent discussion with a small group uh, of experts who have been involved in one way or another uh, with this project uh, uh, over the last uh, year and a half. Uh, and we will end uh, at about 11.30. So I want to start first uh, by saying that uh, it is my privilege to introduce Ambassador Stanley Gao, who is the serving representative of the Taipei Economic and Cultural Representative Office to the United States. Ambassador Gao assumed his position in June of 2016. And as much as he looked forward to coming to Washington, D.C., I know he was very sorry to leave his post as head of the Taipei Representative Office in Italy, where he consumed some of the world's finest wine and cuisine from 2013 to 2016. So as an aficionado of, uh, of baseball, when he isn't busy with his day job, Ambassador Gao enjoys attending Major League Baseball games. And I want you all to know he doesn't just cheer from the seats. He's thrown out the first pitch from the mound in four games, though not yet for the Nationals, so we're still waiting. And not one of those pitches is bounced. So we know that he's counting uh, the days until the beginning of the 2018 baseball season, which is in 10 weeks. <laughs> Ambassador Gao has kept a strong and steady hand on the tiller of US-Taiwan relations, and he plays a very key role in Washington, and uh, we very much look, look forward to hearing his uh, remarks today. So please join me in welcoming Ambassador Stanley Gao. Here you go, sir. Thank you, Bonnie. Well, thank you very much, Barney, and uh, my dear old friends, Minister Zhang Deng. Hi, good morning. And also my belated uh, Happy New Year to all our friends here. Uh, so if I may, uh, first of all, congratulate Barney and your excellent team for this successful uh, report launch. And of course, also to thank uh, CSIS for hosting this very important discussion. Hello, excuse me. Uh, this is Taiwan side. We actually cannot hear you right now. So could the technical assistant personnel 
check if there's any problem with the connection. Thank you. So this is about uh, high tech, low tech, no tech. <laughs> but I, I guess uh, my uh, short remarks will be about you know, thanking the CSIS. I mean, this is such an important uh, uh, discussion on President Tsai Ing-wen's signature foreign policy and economic initiative. But if I may, you know, exactly uh, this time, two years ago, the voters in Taiwan gave Tsai Ing-wen and her party a chance to lead the country you know, at a very critical, uh, challenging juncture, both internally and externally, cross-trade relations and Taiwan's international space. And exactly this time, 364 days ago, many of our people here in this room were not very sure what to or not to expect for the new administration in town. And now 12 months gone by, uh, we gather here. I think uh, it's uh, very important, it's only fitting that we have a quick uh, reflection on you know, this uh, U.S.-Taiwan relations for the last 12 months. And we at the TechCrow, and some of our good colleagues are here, uh, we have many, many reasons to celebrate uh, we believe uh, such a robust, you know, strong bilateral ties, and which has been proved, have been proved, I don't know, sustainable, predictable, mutually beneficial, and uh, rock solid. And uh, through a lot of hard work, smart work, a lot of mutual trust. So uh, this partnership, this relationship, I think has been uh, firmly grounded in our shared core values of democracy, uh, liberty, uh, abiding respect for human rights, and the open market economy. And of course, many common interests you know, across the board. But uh, I think from uh, investment to trade, and from high tech to biotech, and to defense, security, and the clean energy, counterterrorism, and humanitarian assistance, to name just a few. And uh, did you know that the Freedom House just publishes the annual report this week? For the year 2017, Taiwan has been rated the second freest country in our part of Asia Pacific, only after Japan. So two years in a row, and for, in terms of the political rights, civil liberties, freedom of speech, freedom of the press, Taiwan is, for many years, among the freest in the world. And uh, we never take anything for granted. And as my president uh, tweeted in this, uh, his remarks, that uh, oh. Oh, So can you hear me? Okay. So uh, my president uh, remarked that after the published publication of this uh, Freedom House report, Taiwan has never and will not cease to be a beacon of democracy and human dignity. And this is what Taiwan is about. And this is what Taiwan stands for. So this partnership, if I may go back to this partnership, which we believe is steadfast, reliable, and de dependable, and as a showcase in President Tsai Ing-wen's four transit stopovers in the United States during the last 12 months. And we cannot thank enough the United States government, the AIT, the, the American people, you know, because my president was treated with safety, comfort, convenience, and ultimate dignity. And so this is a gracious hospitality and some impeccable arrangement when President Tsai Ing-wen made her transit stopovers. This is another demonstration. And another important e example is that both Taiwan and the United States for the last 12 months has also collaborated 
to make meaningful contribution to the international development and the capacity building projects uh, through a remarkable mechanism called GCTF, Global Cooperation and Training Framework. And so we'll be able to benefit through our joint effort the so dozens of countries, developing countries and island states in the South East Asia, in South Asia, and some of the Pacific island states. And we also appreciate that there's a 1.4 billion US dollars arms sales package, you know, by the Trump administration, six months into the office, and as well as regular, constant dialogues and consultation and cooperations on these issues of our mutual concern and interest. So uh, all this is, uh, as a matter of fact, under the commitment of Taiwan Relations Act 1979 and the Six Assurances. And speaking of Taiwan Relations Act, and I had the pleasure of being invited just the other day to Congress when Senator Bob Dole was receiving this Congressional Gold Medal. And I specifically thank him for being one of the original authors of this historical legislation, which is, remains the bedrock of U.S.-Taiwan relations. And of course, Senator Dole, throughout the decades, unwavering champion of robust U.S.-Taiwan relationship. So uh, we, when uh, Ambassador Moriarty, James Moriarty of the AIT, during his most recent trip to Taipei last uh, December, and uh, he commented, I mean, unequivocally about the U.S.-Taiwan relations, you know, cannot be finer and better and stronger. So uh, we cannot agree with him more. I mean, to keep Taiwan safe, democratic, free, and strong means so much to, to all of us. So against uh, this background, uh, I think uh, President Tsai Ing-wen's audacious vision and uh, on this new southbound policy is not only our key strategy in Asia, but also in a bold endeavor to build upon this staunch U.S.-Taiwan relationship. So during President Trump's recent uh, visit, Asia visit, and uh, some of his pronouncements that the clear message was that Uncle Sam is here to stay. And uh, the American commitment to a free and open Indo-Pacific was so very encouraging. And also the national security strategy once again demonstrated that American leadership in Asia remains as potent and as strong as ever. So including clearly reaffirming Washington, Washington's commitment to the Taiwan Relations Act and to meet Taiwan's defense needs and to deter coercion. So therefore, under President Tsai Ing-wen and my government, we all stand ready, willing, and available to be a natural partner of this Indo-Pacific strategy. So by taking a vital and a proactive role in this process to expand our connectivities on the basis of equality and a mutual respect, no flexing muscles, no saber rattling, uh, we believe Taiwan can definitely make a significant contributions to the entire region and also in this rules-based international order. So once again, you know, kind of uh, given my age, well, like once again, exactly 40 years ago, this time, I joined the Taiwan's Foreign Service, 1978. And many of our friends in this room may be old enough to remember what happened that year, December 1978. 10 days before Christmas came the shocking news of de-recognition and the breakup of official relationship. And now, 
Of course, the rest is history. But as our American friends always like to say, when the tough gets going, the, go the going gets tough, the tough gets going. And we've come a long way. Of course, we still have a, a long way to go. But I think uh, as we gather here, when the rest of history, we still have a lot of work to do. And through our tireless hard work, smart work, lots of uh, mutual trust, I believe we have every reason as Tecro and as many of our friends here in town, overwhelming bipartisan support. I think uh, we have reason to stay focused and uh, optimistic, looking forward and forging ahead this such uh, important relationship and a partnership to another level. So thank you very much for having me this morning, and I wish the discussion today is most stimulating and equally inspiring. Thank you very much. It was actually, I think for me, 39 years ago this month that I, uh, I arrived in Taiwan where I went to study um, uh, Chinese uh, after I graduated from university. And uh, at that time, it, I arrived three weeks after the United States had actually formally broken diplomatic ties with Taiwan. So it was a very challenging period. We have come a very long way. Uh, but the U.S.-Taiwan relationship has remained strong. Um, it has moved from strength to strength, and I think it continues to have a very bright future. Every country has its national treasures, and our keynote speaker today is one of Taiwan's national treasures. Minister John Dung has had a distinguished career in the service of his country. He has held senior positions in the Mainland Affairs Council, in the Taiwan Representative Office in Washington, D.C., uh, in the National Security Council, and uh, as Minister of the uh, Ministry of Economic Affairs. Um, and he retired from that last post in 2016. But President Tsai Ing-wen persuaded him to take on the challenging task of heading Taiwan's trade negotiations. Well, I imagine that this is one of the toughest jobs <laughs> in Taiwan but there is certainly no one who is more capable. And we are extremely grateful uh, to John Dung, Minister Without Portfolio and Head of the Office of Trade Negotiations for speaking with us today uh, from Taipei uh, late at night. So we're very grateful that your entire staff has <laughs> stayed up with you uh, to talk to us today about Taiwan's uh, new southbound policy. So please join me in welcoming Minister John Dung. Thank you very much, uh, Bunny, uh, Ambassador Gao, friends, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I wish you all having a very good morning in Washington, D.C. Uh, I also have uh, many of my colleagues uh, with me. Uh, the camera is not, uh, uh, cannot take all of their pictures. Uh, but uh, I hear I have around, uh, somewhere around 20 to 30 colleagues. Uh, I, first of all, I would like to uh, give my thanks to uh, CSIS for organizing this event uh, and giving me the opportunity to, give, to make this presentation on Taiwan's new southbound policy. Uh, my presentation uh, will proceed in three parts. First, uh, I will give you an introduction to Taiwan's new southbound policy. Then, uh, I will talk about Taiwan's soft power and our future plan. I wish to present to you that the uh, core foundation and the value 
of this policy is the spirit of inclusiveness, openness, and cooperation. And here, I would like to stress that Taiwan's new southbound policy embraces inclusiveness. Therefore, we do not preclude cooperation with anyone. And this, of course, includes the One Belt, One Road initiative. And uh, I will end my presentation with some proposals for cooperation between United States and Taiwan. And then uh, I'll make some uh, short concluding remarks. I wish this can all be done in 20 minutes, as uh, Bonnie asked me. Uh, the Asia Pacific region has been increasing in global importance. Uh, countries in the region have shown rapid economic growth. Indeed, the IMF pro projects that the average GDP growth of countries in the region will be at 5.4% in 2018, more than the global average of 3.7%. Uh, these countries are of great strategic importance to many countries. As such, uh, many countries have policies with respect to the region, such as India's Act East policy, Korea's new southern policy, and the U.S. vision in the Indo-Pacific. As you can see in the box on the left side, Taiwan's partners countries under the new southbound policy include ASEAN countries, South Asia countries, and Australia and New Zealand, 18 in total. But they are very important economic economic partners to us. The uh, total trade volume between Taiwan and its partner countries has doubled compared with the year of 2000. Taiwan's export to these partner countries now count over 21% of Taiwan's total exports. ASEAN countries are a major destination for FDI from Taiwan. Uh, there are around 10,000 companies from Taiwan have invested up to $100 billion in ASEAN countries, creating up to uh, 4 million jobs at least. And two-way travel between Taiwan and its partner countries have more than doubled since 2000, from 2.2 million people to 4.7 million. And the number of flights between Taiwan and partner countries has increased significantly. I just give you a number here. Uh, for instance, there are more than 200 flights between Taiwan and Vietnam every week now. Over the uh, past 40 years, uh, Taiwan has developed a number of advantages which are unique in Asia. Advantages that I will refer to as soft power. Taiwan's new south, southbound policy will be carried out by showcasing Taiwan's soft power in various sectors. For example, uh, in agriculture, Taiwan has created a supporting system to help farmers with production, management, sales, and disease control. Taiwan also provides long-term support for agricultural research in breedings, cultivation, and pest control. We had have had very uh, remarkable achievements in the areas such as rice, vegetable, fruits, and flowers. Uh, Taiwan also promotes agricultural processing technologies to balance agricultural supply and demand. 
uh, especially during bumper harvest seasons. Uh, in order to increase added value of agricultural products and the, the income of farmers. Uh, next, I would like to address soft power, our soft power in the public health sector. Taiwan has been able to provide high quality, affordable health care, even though its total health expenditure makes up only 6.6% of the total GDP. Uh, I think probably some of you know that it is 17.1 in the United States and 10.2 in Japan. And our national health insurance system is ranked as one of the best in the world. Uh, further, Taiwan has highly advanced medical technology and medical teams specializing in some surgery, such as liver transplants, corrective jaw surgery, and the in vitro fertilization, all of which have very high success rate. Uh, Taiwan also has a great record of public health and disease control. Currently, there, is, there are no cases of smallpox, rabies, malaria, or polio in Taiwan. And uh, we have proven that it can quickly contain outbreaks of infectious diseases, such as dengue fever, which troubles many countries in Asia. In 2014, we had over 15,000 cases. In 2016, this number was reduced to 744. And just last year, to 343. Uh, you see from the table that you cannot find any other country in the region that can contain outbreaks of a highly infectious disease as quickly as this. In technology and industry, Taiwan has long supported research and development institutions and the efficient technology transfer system. Uh, Taiwan's industry have formed many industry clusters, including the IC manufacturing cluster in Xinzhou area, machinery cluster in central Taiwan, digital content cluster in Nangang Software Park, for instance. Probably some of you have uh, visited some, some of this area. Uh, next, uh, you, I think uh, you notice that uh, Taiwan is frequently hit with many different kinds of natural disasters. We have at least three to four typhoons a year and is often struck with large scale earthquakes. Uh, because of this, we have accumulated extensive experiences in disaster prevention and relief. Uh, indeed, Asia's largest disaster relief training center is located in Taiwan. Uh, that's in Zhushan, central part of Taiwan. Uh, private charitable organizations in Taiwan have also long engaged in post-disaster relief and reconstruction efforts, both in Taiwan and abroad. For example, Ciji is well known for, for providing immediate post-disaster relief to the disaster stricken area. Uh, in education, uh, Taiwan offers high quality, yet affordable higher education. As you can see from this table, Taiwan's public and private university tuition fees are much lower compared to other countries. 
for instance, tuition fees are almost double in Japan and are almost, sorry to say that, 10 times in the cost in the United States for private universities. Uh, further, Taiwan's vocational schools are highly integrated with industries. Students have more opportunities to find internship, to get on the job, on the job training and develop their career. Uh, SME, small medium enterprises, are also a very important part of Taiwan's soft power. Uh, they have very uh, good skill uh, in developing uh, new products, very flexible. Uh, the small, very small size company has uh, great experience and the capability to develop international market. Uh, through the uh, new southbound policy, Taiwan seeks to foster regional prosperity and development and to expand cooperation with its partners, countries in economic and trade collaboration, people to people exchanges, resources sharing, and the institutional links. Uh, in this regard, we already see very remarkable progress in trade, which has grown over 15% in last year uh, compared to the uh, preceding uh, year. And the investment, which has increasing, increased by nearly 60% since the launch of New Southbound Palace. For travel, inbound travel increased by over 30% in the past year. And for education exchanges, there have been at almost 10% increase of incoming students to Taiwan from Southeast Asia. Uh, the main focus of our future work for the new Southbound policy will be under the guidance of uh, flagship programs. For instance, in agriculture, we have programs for providing agricultural training to farmers from partner countries. We hope to work with them to develop crops with high economic value to them, such as orchid, passion fruits, lychee, to name a few, among other more. There are also programs in place to increase bilateral agricultural trade and investment. In the field of public health, uh, we will provide uh, larger uh, capacity of training program to government officials of ASEAN countries uh, under uh, Ambassador Gao just mentioned GCTF between Taiwan and the United States. We also will seek to establish a regional joint epidemic prevention network with partner countries. Uh, we have programs in place to promote training and capacity building in this area. Uh, in, in industry innovation, uh, we select industry cooperation projects based on the needs of partner countries and the strength of Taiwan's industries. Uh, areas such as shipbuildings, automotive parts, and textile. Now, uh, there are already uh, uh, some activities uh, uh, going on now. Regarding talent development, we will expand our study and internship program. We have also been increasing the number of scholarships uh, offered to those to students from there. Uh, we have also established the Yisan Forum. Uh, as a platform to, for dialogue between non-government organizations, the youth, and think tanks. Uh, some of you attended uh, that forum uh, in Taiwan at uh, uh, last year. 
We have also implemented a transparent official development assistance program, which partner countries may use to help improve their infrastructure. Taiwan also uh, will continue to make efforts to increase more tourism and cultural exchange with uh, our uh, partner countries. Uh, for instance, we have taken steps, and of course, we will work harder to uh, create a more Muslim-friendly environment in Taiwan. Uh, we hope we can attract more travelers from Muslim countries. The uh, important aspect of New South Bank policy, however, is its spirit of inclusiveness, openness, and cooperation. Uh, as such, uh, Taiwan is willing to cooperate with the United States' vision in the Indo-Pacific. Uh, Taiwan's New South Bank policy seeks to create an overarching dialogue and cooperation to foster trust and understanding in Asia-Pacific region. Uh, we believe this is consistent with the U.S. vision of a free and open Indo-Pacific, uh, a place where we all can be prosperous side by side. Uh, further, we believe this is consistent with U.S. economic development policy for Asia-Pacific region, as U.S. is seeking to create, uh, this is a quote from uh, uh, the report that U.S. issued and uh, uh, pres uh, President Trump's speech, create robust trade relations and to strengthen the bonds of commerce between all Indo-Pacific nations. We uh, have also thought of some possible areas of cooperation with the United States. For instance, in economics and trade, we see possible in industry cooperation in SMEs, manufacturing, e-commerce, and energy. For capacity building, we see possible areas of cooperation in disease prevention, uh, some of you probably know that uh, uh, we have a, a very good cooperation program with NIH on uh, many of the public health uh, uh, programs. And women's empowerment, humanitarian and disaster relief. We could also broaden capacity building in other areas, such as cybersecurity. For public infrastructure, President Trump's announcement, I quote, to reform development finance institutions to direct efforts toward high quality infrastructure investment that promotes economic growth is aligned with our goal to initiate an ODA program that will help improve public infrastructure in partner countries. Uh, we could also incorporate issues of mutual interest into existing U.S.-Taiwan dialogues frameworks. We could increase dialogue between government officials, facilitate exchange between our trade associations in the region, and enhance cooperation between think tanks. Uh, we could also encourage capacity building in partner countries through GCTF on issues such as e-commerce, SMEs and the youth exchange. Taiwan's main objective under uh, New South Bank policy is to deepen trade relations with on a mutually beneficial basis and maximize trade liberalization. We believe this is consistent with President Trump's announcement <coughs> to make bilateral trade re agreement with any Indo-Pacific nation that will abide by the principle of fair and reciprocal trade. <coughs> 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 
excuse me, at the APEC uh, leaders meeting. Don't worry, it's come to the end of, of my uh, presentation. Uh, Taiwan is very interested in uh, pursuing such an agreement with the uh, United States, and which could serve as a model in Indo-Pacific. Uh, finally, <coughs> I would like uh, to note that last month, Taiwan's legislature amended our pharmaceutical act, which will establish Taiwan's very first patent linkage system. Uh, this is a result of consultation under TIFA framework and also proves that we are able to resolve difficult issues through cooperation. That uh, uh, and my presentation, and uh, I thank you very much for listening uh, my presentation today. And again, I would like to thank CSIS for organizing this event, especially Bunny, for your great efforts in putting this together. The uh, new southbound policy is very important to Taiwan, and uh, we are very grateful to have the opportunity to share it with you today. And now, if uh, anyone has any questions, I'll be more than happy to take them and we'll answer them to the best of my ability. Thank you very much. Thank you, Minister Deng. Um, that was very comprehensive, and thank you for looking forward and talking about what Taiwan might do in the future uh, in its new southbound policy. Uh, there is indeed, I think, uh, a lot of alignment between Taiwan's goals in the new southbound policy and the Trump administration's Indo-Pacific and those Indo-Pacific or southward policies of several other uh, countries in the region. Um, and as you say, there is a lot of prospect for uh, cooperation, uh, I think, to advance uh, common interests. It was also quite notable uh, that you mentioned that no country is excluded uh, from the new southbound policy. Some newspaper articles have portrayed the, the new southbound policy as somehow um, a, uh, an, an effort to challenge uh, the uh, mainland China's one belt, one road policy. And, 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 and I think that that is, um, is very incorrect. And so I'm glad that you said <laughs> that there is even potential uh, for Beijing uh, to find ways to uh, cooperate with, uh, with Taipei in this endeavor. So before I open it up to uh, those of us who are uh, attending here to ask questions, I think I'll just start by posing one of my own, if that is okay with you. Um, sure, one, please, Bonnie. Uh, great. So uh, one of your, uh, of course, responsibilities um, is to oversee and negotiate uh, economic and trade agreements uh, with, uh, with countries um, around the world. And so I wonder if you could talk a bit about what the role is of governmental agreements uh, in the new southbound policy. How important are they? Uh, I've read stories about some of the agreements I think recently have been signed between Taiwan and the Philippines. Um, I know some of your bilateral investment agreements with uh, some of your neighbors are quite outdated and need, uh, need, need updating. Um, and perhaps there's uh, a need for things like uh, avoidance of double taxation uh, agreements. So, so how critical are these agreements and uh, for the success of the new southbound policy? And maybe you can talk a little bit about your progress in that area. Thank you. Uh, thank you very, very much, uh, Bonnie, uh, and uh, for the questions. The uh, agreement. Uh, serve the purpose as a foundation for the uh, for to provide a safe, uh, a stable uh, framework for the business community uh, to conduct to engage 
uh, their business. business. So uh, the agreement, such as uh, you mentioned, investment and the prevention of double taxation, and uh, even uh, some SPS uh, sanitary, federal sanitary inspection agreement, uh, customs cooperation agreements, those are all very important uh, when countries want to engage more heavily on trade and economic ac activities. So we see that is very important. We see that is non-political. Uh, we see that serve the, our shared purpose for the economic prosperity. Now come to the next question as uh, what's the progress, progress now? Uh, uh, you mentioned that, and I'm very glad that uh, we met uh, uh, the, uh, our agreement, investment agreement with the Philippines went through uh, last month. Uh, I can tell you it was a difficult uh, negotiation uh, a subject. Uh, we, we cover many areas. Uh, for instance, on the uh, scope of the investment. Now, uh, the previous agreement, which was uh, signed uh, more than 20 years ago, only covered manufacturing sectors. Now, investment is much uh, bigger now. And of course, we want uh, the uh, uh, more equitable and more uh, safe and, and um, better dispute settlement mechanism. And uh, I think we all know that uh, we want uh, investment from Philippines to Taiwan, and Philippines want our investment uh, to that place. So uh, we conducted that uh, negotiation very carefully. Uh, we didn't want to cause Philippines any embarrassment. Uh, the agreement was signed between two representative offices. Uh, and uh, I think the business community are very happy. I can tell you our business community are very happy that the agreement went through. Uh, we will, uh, our investment to Vietnam, to India, uh, to many Asia countries are getting more and more. And uh, we hope that uh, others can follow uh, this example uh, since it is beneficial to uh, both countries and uh, uh, to the region. Thank you very much, Minister. Uh, we'll now open the floor. Um, we have a full house, and uh, I hope we have some really good questions. So please raise your hand, wait for the microphone, and identify yourself and uh, speak clearly, and, uh, and hopefully we will be heard at both ends. Who would like to ask the first question? Yes, Russell Xiao. Uh, thank you very much, Bonnie, and thank you, Minister Dung. Um, my name is Russell Xiao. I am uh, with the Global Taiwan Institute. Um, there are growing concerns um, in Washington and around the world about China's sharp power or its influence operations that leverages soft power assets uh, to coerce um, other countries. Um, into accepting its political uh, goals. Do you see, and you've spoken a, a great deal about Taiwan's soft power as assets in its southbound policy. I wonder whether or not you see a role in terms of how Taiwan can mitigate um, you know, these concerns about China's sharp power uh, through its southbound policy. Thank you. Uh, I, uh, yes, of course, we see uh, China is, is using its uh, influences 
uh, in the region. Uh, I think we can see very clearly that um, uh, for for instance, in the uh, the countries where uh, will receive the pressure from China. However, I always wonder if students wants to come Taiwan to study and to work uh, to train themselves, be better prepared in the future. A, a country wants to uh, improve their public health care to their citizens, or they, are, they want uh, to help the farmers to uh, increase their income. What political power can stop them doing that? Uh, I think uh, gradually, gradually, uh, nations in the region will understand that uh, we can use the other power that is the soft power we we refer to uh, to help the society to help its citizens to improve the life and to let them understand I think this process will gradually demonstrate an open society, a democratic society, a very friendly society. Uh, it's better. And uh, uh, we, are, we are very convinced if we all continue these efforts, uh, the so-called sharp power the influence, the sharp power, uh, will be able to to be mitigated. That's that's my uh, my uh, view and my comments on that uh, very difficult question. Thank you. Okay. Next question. Over here on the left, please wait for the wait for the microphone. Just one second. Okay. Thank you. I'm Justin uh, from Taiwan, and I'm a teacher at uh, Damkang University uh, Department of Diplomacy and International Relations. I have a question uh, to uh, Minister Deng. Uh, uh, currently, Taiwan's economic is not so strong as before. So do you think how Taiwan should uh, promote our uh, uh, economic stress uh, to uh, mutually beneficial with all the ASEAN member states? Uh, and then uh, the second question would be, uh, how can uh, Taiwan do everything uh, and have a mutual uh, benefit with all the ASEAN member states in the uh, so-called uh, new South Bank's policy. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for that question. Yeah, yes, yes uh, we, as in my presentation, uh, indicates that, uh, uh, as a matter of fact, uh, we see a very strong growth in uh, Southeast Asia, India, they all have very impressive uh, growth in recent years. Uh, for instance, India has 7% uh, growth uh, uh, in, in for several years. Uh, Philippines also has very impressive, close to 7% growth. Now, what kind of advantages we have uh, to uh, work with them, to cooperate with them and uh, uh, share uh, the uh, benefits of this cooperation. Uh, I think Taiwan has several advantages that we can offer. One, small, medium and enterprises. The system that help those enterprises to prosper. Uh, 
now we all face a challenge that the benefit of the uh, economic liberalization or trade liberalization is not very well, uh, very balanced, distributed in, uh, in, in all societies. In many, I think with many, many, uh, most of the countries in the world has that prob encountered that problem. And uh, one of the remedies, as we can see, is to help these small medium enterprises to grow. And uh, they'll, uh, if they can function better, if they uh, can make themselves more prosper, uh, certainly this uneven distribution of wealth uh, will be able to, to improve. I think uh, we do have some experiences here. As you can see, uh, the numbers of the small business uh, in Taiwan. And uh, another advantage is, is the uh, vocational training combined with the uh, industry's uh, need. That's another thing uh, which can provide very good technicians uh, for the industry. Uh, we, we we think, uh, and uh, our experience and our uh, engagement with uh, many uh, partner countries can confirm uh, that those advantages are very well uh, welcome by them. And uh, that's why there are so many programs uh, are gradually forming and uh, are uh, functioning now. Uh, for the mutual benefits, uh, of course, this is not one way. The whole thing is for reciprocal. Uh, the idea of New South Bank policy is for, to reciprocal. We want to export, we want to import. Uh, some of you may notice that uh, uh, after we launch the, uh, the launch of no New South Bank policy, our import from the region actually uh, growth, grow uh, more than our export. We work on that. And uh, the investment in the past was pretty much going one way from Taiwan to them. And now we are very happy to see uh, some uh, cases that uh, investment from our partner countries is coming into Taiwan. So uh, those are uh, the mutual uh, mutual uh, benefit are gradually uh, shown in that uh, effort. So uh, we we do have um, uh, many uh, many uh, areas that uh, we think we can uh, work with them. Okay. Next question. Okay. Mike Fonte in the front, and then we'll go to the back. Minister Dung, glad to see you. This is Mike Fonte. I'm the director of the DPP's office here in Washington. Uh, in terms of fair and reciprocal trade, you, you've talked about the Pharma, Pharma Act, which opens up the uh, patent linkage, linkage problem. There are other issues which have been on the table between in terms of opening up Taiwan to make it more free and open in terms of trade. I wonder if you'd talk a little bit about some of the other areas where the legislature and the, and the administration is trying to work towards opening up Taiwan even more. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much, Michael. Uh, glad to see you, although I only can see you from your back. Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, I Turn tell around and wave. It is you. <laughs> Uh, yes, uh, the uh, patent linkage uh, in the uh, Pharmaceutical Act Amendment uh, of uh, Pharmaceutical Act, the process is, is quite uh, difficult. Uh, I'm very, uh, I think I can tell you here that uh, we work very closely with the uh, ruling party uh, legislatures. Uh, in for for quite long time, and uh, uh, we also work with uh, uh, industries 
in different interests. Here is generic versus patent uh, pharmaceutical companies. Uh, I think through those efforts, uh, we can find a balance. Uh, we can find as a balance point, balance uh, uh, a balance between different interests. Uh, on other issues, on other issues which uh, uh, that uh, we uh, are facing now, uh, one uh, uh, I know what you you uh, are referring to, Michael. Uh, some of the issues is easier, are easier. Some of the issues are, are very uh, challenging, very difficult. Uh, I would like to say that the awareness of the society is very, is a basic thing we have to, uh, to do. If a society has is suspicious with certain products, then uh, we need to work together with the foreign suppliers, with our health administration, with our scientists to clear that suspicion, to make sure that they are comfortable with uh, certain uh, elements. Uh, we know we have uh, challenges on certain products. We will work uh, very hard uh, and try to solve that in the near future. So thank you again, uh, Michael, for the question. Okay, there was a, a question in the back. Uh, hello, Mr. Minister. It's good to see you. This is Melissa Morris from CNM International. <laughs> I enjoyed hearing your remarks very much. Um, I, the area that I would like to know more about, and perhaps you can elaborate, is how using the new southbound policy, Taiwan and the United States could find more areas of cooperation. For example, you were talking about some non-traditional areas like infrastructure and energy. How do you think our two governments could work together in some of these other areas beyond just trade and, and investment. Thank you. <laughs> the, uh, thank you, thank you, thank you. I'm very glad to, uh, that we can see each other in, from the air. Uh, Non-traditional area in education, area, energy, uh, those are the areas we can, uh, I think uh, the cybersecurity, digital economy, I can name a very long list that uh, uh, US, US and Taiwan can uh, work together. Uh, as a matter of, that's right. Uh, the uh, the uh, Jenny just helped me uh, to uh, point out that uh, the uh, uh, we are working together on the uh, vaccine uh, vaccine products that uh, can be used uh, to uh, prevent the spread of uh, disease here. Uh, I think through GCTF. And we have proven that uh, the uh, GCTF provides very good basis for uh, US and Taiwan on environmental protection, on the public health area, uh, on education. And uh, we hope that uh, 
uh, we can uh, work together uh, beyond trade uh, side. And uh, uh, for instance, for startup development, uh, there are many, many talents in Asia. Uh, I think uh, US and Taiwan can work together to cultivate more uh, young talents, young, uh, startup, startup companies uh, here. So, uh, Melissa, you, uh, you know that <laughs> uh, we, we always are very enthusiastic uh, to find new areas to work with the United States. Another question? Okay, over here. Thank you very much, Mr. Deng. My name is Dong Hui Yu with China Review News Agency of Hong Kong. Uh, you mentioned that the new southbound policy is open and inclusive. Is it open to the companies from the mainland China? If it is, is there any precondition? Thank you. The uh, the uh, inclusive of of course uh, the basic. I I think I mentioned that in my uh, presentation. Uh, we uh, uh, the basic principle of our society is based is built on democracy, freedom, uh, and uh, any. Uh, programs, any initiatives based on democracy, based on freedom, uh, is welcomed in Taiwan. Uh, I mentioned that inclusiveness uh, on New South Bank policy is the thing that Bunny also mentioned. It's not, it, it, uh, we hope that someday, if there is a need, uh, we can work uh, even uh, with the uh, One Belt, One Road initiative. Uh, as to any thing that, uh, if not based on openness, uh, freedom, uh, democracy that certainly we are uh, we we will have difficult difficulty to uh, to uh, to work with okay next question yes there's a young man over there um, thank you so much for your time minister uh, my name is Vincent um, I'm a graduate student here at Georgetown University. Um, I had a question regarding uh, what sort of role uh, migrant laborers from uh, NSP countries play in the new southbound policy and whether there are uh, labor reforms going into streamlining uh, a lot of uh, migrant laborers coming to Taiwan. Thank you. Uh, uh, yes, uh, thank you, Vincent. Uh, there are about uh, six, about six hundred sixty thousand uh, foreign uh, workers uh, now work with us uh, in our society in different sectors, uh, and uh, uh, there are several things I think uh, worthwhile for us to mention here. The basic uh, wage applies to them. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, the uh, uh, we since of the uh, shortage of labor here, we treat them with all the protections in the same level as our domestic worker. Uh, and we also relaxing our regulations uh, to allow easier process, procedure 
for those who are interested in to stay, to live in Taiwan, to stay. Uh, we, uh, as a matter of fact, we encourage students who graduated, who graduated from our universities, uh, to uh, to stay in uh, and to work in Taiwan. We, uh, in these two years, in past two years, we make the uh, we change the regulations. Uh, we make uh, our uh, environment much more friendly uh, to them. So uh, I think the uh, migrant workers in Taiwan now will receive uh, very uh, equitable uh, treatments as, our, as ours. Thank you, Vincent. I think there was a question up here in front. Hi, Chia Ching from United Daily News Group. Nice to see you again. Um, I would like to go back to Mike Fonte's question. Um, so perhaps the area that's hard to open that you were referring is pork and beef. Um, I was just wondering if, because you said the government will be working very hard to solve this problem, but Taiwan has been working on this for a very long time. So. Does the Thai administration has different strategies compared to the previous administration? And also, do you have a timetable for it? Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, <laughs> Ms. Tsang. Uh, the, uh, yeah, we, 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 uh, we have to work. We have to face this issue. Uh, the approach now, uh, the major concern. Some of the uh, some of the uh, people argues this is a trade protectionism, protectionist uh, major. Uh, but our observation is more on the consumers and the society's concern over their health. Uh, so there are two error, two fronts we have to work on. One, of course, we have to minimize the, uh, uh, the farmer's uh, resistance or their concern. I think more important and more challenging is the uh, uh, how to uh, let the people understand that their health concern, their concerns on health, has stronger scientific uh, evidence to support the otherwise. But uh, we are all are consumers. And uh, in a society, something, if it is believed by the majority of their citizens, that means we have to work harder. That means the government has to work together. That means the scientists have to work harder. The uh, trade associations, of course, also need uh, to tell, to let the, uh, and to find a solution to assure the consumers that uh, they are concern their health will not be compromised I, I think uh, uh, I think we can uh, we can do it we can make it but it is not an easy way 
uh, I here I'm I have to tell to tell you that uh, there is no time table for that, uh, but uh, we shall not uh, stop our working in these two fronts. So, uh, Sangja, thank you very much for the question. Thank you, Minister Dung. Um, uh, your, your media always asks the toughest questions. We know that. Um, so I'm very <laughs> grateful for you taking on these very sensitive issues. Um, and you've been very generous with your time. Um, perhaps I'll just ask you one last question. It will be a little easier. Uh, <laughs> in your presentation, uh, you talked about a new ODA uh, initiative, and, and I have not uh, read about this, so I, I don't know if there are things available publicly that I have missed. But I'm wondering if you can elaborate a bit how much uh, money has been allocated to this new ODA initiative? When will Taiwan start considering uh, funding specific projects? Can you just tell us a little more about this ODA plan? Uh, okay, thank you, uh, Pani, for that uh, uh, question. Uh, we, uh, we see there is a great need in particularly in Southeast Asia countries, for uh, the improvement of their infrastructure. Uh, for instance, in Vietnam, uh, it's 2,000 kilometers from north to south. Uh, 20 years ago, about 20 years ago, we uh, used our financial institutions to provide them a low interest loan and help them build a bridge, which later proved it's very helpful to the community. And uh, we also see that uh, uh, ADB and uh, or our uh, Korea, Japanese, Japan uh, are also uh, helping them uh, to have programs to offer uh, the uh, management skill, uh, new equipment, <coughs> low uh, interest loan. So uh, in the past few months, uh, we put up, put together a plan, a program that uh, we think, <coughs> excuse me, uh, our capitals in Taiwan now, really we have abundance of uh, unused capital. So we put together, uh, uh, we think we can uh, uh, gather a, uh, the fund uh, of the, the capital around uh, it, each one hundred billion Taiwan dollar. That's equivalent to about three point five billion U.S. dollar. Uh, and uh, uh, we also the budget fight is still going on now uh, in these few days. But uh, we also uh, provide uh, some uh, government fund to help uh, to subsidize the. Uh, uh, interest rate. So we will offer low interest rate to the host government for the projects that they are interested in. And we'll work with them. Money, uh, you know well, uh, in, in, uh, uh, in the case of Taiwan, we uh, we will not ship our workers to there. We will not totally use our building materials to there. We will not charge enormous maintenance fee there. We will work with the local communities to build up their capacities uh, 
in the process of construction, in the process, their capacity to maintain uh, their, uh, the work that we, we finish. So this will apply to infrastructures. Uh, for instance, uh, like bridges, road, ports, dams, uh, which we all have very good experiences uh, here in Taiwan. Uh, the, this program now has been approved. Uh, I think the budget process, the budget fight will, will go through. I'm very confident that we can start this program uh, very soon and work with our uh, partner country, the government of our, of our partner countries. So I can provide you more information, uh, Bunny, on this uh, particular uh, program. That's great. Um, we really appreciate uh, your participation today, your, your speech, your elaboration of uh, the New Southbound policy, and uh, of course, your willingness to answer all of these very uh, tough questions. Uh, please do take care of your health. Get some rest. <laughs> um, and, Sorry for uh, the coughing. Yeah. Oh, no worries. No worries. We, you, you. There's, there's a lot of um, uh, f various forms of flu going around everywhere. So uh, do take care of your health. <laughs> Um, in fact, my colleague, uh, Matt Goodman, sends his regrets. He was supposed to be here today to introduce you and to moderate this Q&A, but unfortunately, uh, he came down with something overnight, and this morning, uh, he said that he really needed to stay home. So um, again, he, uh, he, uh, he sends his apologies. Uh, but we've reached the end of this portion uh, of our event, and, and we will take a break. And uh, after that, we're going to have a really excellent panel to dig into some of the issues raised uh, this morning by uh, Minister Dung. And so I hope that you will all stay with us after you have your coffee and tea. And please join me in thanking Minister John Dung. Thank you. Thank you very much, Penny. And thank you very much for all of the friends there. Thank you. Air power and military space systems have revolutionized the way the U.S. military operates, and the global economy increasingly depends on reliable and secure access to space systems. The Aerospace Security Project at CSIS examines the technological, budgetary, and policy issues affecting the air and space domains. Our research is focused in three areas. Space security examines the evolving military uses of space and how the lack of norms of behavior can affect escalation and deterrence. It explores how alternative architectures and new space capabilities can enhance the resilience of U.S. military space systems. Air dominance and long-range strike looks at the future of air and missile forces in a more contested operating environment. It examines the role of stealth, unmanned systems, and autonomous systems, how these capabilities can be integrated to enable new operational concepts, and options for the air and ground-based legs of the nuclear triad. Commercial and civil space explores international partnerships in space, efforts to reduce the cost of launch, advances in commercial space technologies, and policy issues that affect civil and commercial space programs. The goal of the Aerospace Security Project is to provide innovative, insightful, and timely analysis to help educate and inform decision makers. As new opportunities, threats, and technologies emerge, smart policy decisions can ensure the United States continues to lead in the air and space domains. Welcome to the Aerospace Security Project. The Defense Acquisition System has given the United States military an unmatched technological advantage for over 70 years. Along with its legendary complexity, it's brought us the Abrams tanks, the nuclear aircraft carrier, the amphibious assault vehicle, and the B-2 bomber. Today it spends more than $300 billion a year, nearly three times as much as Amazon's annual worldwide sales. Over 150,000 people and almost 2,000 pages of rules are employed to make sure that money buys what the military needs. 
And much like Amazon, you can find just about anything on DoD's shopping cart. How hard is it to buy all that? Exhibit A, this simple 500 element flow chart that explains how the defense acquisition system works. Let's take a closer look at that framework though. There are three fundamental elements for every acquisition, a need, an appropriation, and a contract. The requirements process defines the need, which is often called a statement of work. The budget process generates the funding, and the contracting process buys the product or service from industry. This structure holds equally for all things in DoD shopping cart, from the simplest to the most complex. For the simplest things, the process can be performed by one government professional in a few days with a requisition order or need, a government purchase card or funding, and a bill of sale or contract. For the most complex acquisitions, hundreds of people are involved in every step of the process over a period of decades. Let's apply this underlying structure to the Pentagon's most complex acquisition program, the Joint Strike Fighter, or F-35. First, the need. In 2000, the Air Force, Navy, and the Marine Corps produced a statement of work for the F-35, also known as an Operational Requirements Document. While there have been some important changes to the document, these basic requirements remain the standard against which the program is judged. Second, the contract. A year later, the DoD awarded Lockheed Martin a contract to develop the F-35 with three variants, one for each service. And while Lockheed has been awarded several F-35 related contracts, this initial contract remains in place to this day. Third, the funding. Since the decisive competition kicked off in 1997, Congress has provided 20 years of appropriations for the F-35. The estimated total budget is more than $1 trillion, which includes all the money necessary to develop, produce, and operate thousands of this aircraft for over 50 years. To date, however, only about 10% of that amount has actually been spent. In other words, the F-35 is only now moving past its initial stages. This three-part underlying structure gives us insight into what makes acquisition work better. As the F-35 illustrates, a well-understood requirement, a clear contract that aligns contractor and government interests, and a realistic budget are crucial building blocks to set early on in the process. Even as we seek new approaches to acquisition, these critical elements will continue to form the foundation of any successful acquisition system. In early August, North Korea threatened to launch four intermediate-range ballistic missiles to a point about 30 or 40 kilometers off the coast of Guam. Tom, could you walk us through how U.S. missile defense systems would respond if such a launch was detected? So if that happens, the United States would first detect the missile's heat signatures with satellites such as the Defense Support Program or the newer space-based infrared system. Those satellites would then cue terrestrial radars, such as the TIPI-2 X-band radars in Japan and South Korea, which track the missiles with greater precision. The threat missiles would be within the radar field of view for perhaps five or six minutes. Aegis BMD ships might also be in position to track the missile's flight. The trajectory of the missiles headed from North Korea to Guam would take them over the southern part of Japan. They'd fly just south of Hiroshima, and at that point they'd be at an altitude of about 700 kilometers. So, Tom, if the U.S. determined that these missiles were actually a threat to Guam, what systems would be called upon to respond? If the U.S. determines the missiles to be a potential threat, we might try to shoot them down using various missile defense interceptors. This might include the sea-launched Standard Missile 3, launched from an Arleigh Burke-class destroyer, or a land-based THAAD battery based in Guam, or some combination of the two. Both systems have an excellent test record, but neither has been used in an operational context against a ballistic missile fired in anger. And all of this would happen within a relatively short period of time. So North Korea said it would take about 17 minutes time of flight uh, to reach Guam. Others have said it could take as little as 14 minutes. Of course, it depends on the specific trajectory used. A more lofted trajectory would take longer and rise to a higher altitude in space, while a more shallow trajectory would take a bit less time and stay at a lower altitude. So an intercept attempt with an Aegis standard missile would be outside the atmosphere, close to its apogee during its mid-course, or during its downward descent with the THAAD system. 
So all of this provides an interesting case study into how such a scenario could unfold and the way U.S. missile defense systems are designed to protect against such threats. Right. This is the kind of threat that we've seen coming for a long time. This is why the systems are located where they are, the radars and the interceptors. Uh, but we hope we don't have to use them. To learn more about both the threat missiles from North Korea and the various missile defense systems, check out missilethreat.csis.org. The divided Korean peninsula remains one of the largest sources of uncertainty and potential conflict in a prosperous and growing Asia. Unification of Korea will be one of the biggest changes to the geopolitical landscape and is seen by the world as a dark tunnel. Opacity among regional powers creates confusion. Misunderstanding impedes smart planning. False assumptions could cause costly strategic blunders. But CSIS believes the potential for growth, prosperity and peace of a united Korea is immense. How can we maximize the social, humanitarian and economic returns of a unified Korea while avoiding conflict? Beyond Parallel is an unprecedented and comprehensive resource for bringing transparency to the many challenges and opportunities of Korean unification. Beyond Parallel investigates the broader implications of unification, but also the specific issues that Korea and the world face. These critical issues are explored through expert analysis, satellite imagery, and cutting-edge methods of data collection. Welcome to Beyond Parallel. China is rising. Its economy is now the second largest in the world. China is the world's largest trader, having surpassed the United States, and Chinese military capabilities are expanding. In just a few decades, China has moved from the periphery to the center of the international system. But what does that really mean for the world? In some ways, China is a developed country, yet in other ways, it is still developing. China's transformation is often misunderstood, and the future of Chinese power is uncertain. Power itself is a nebulous concept. Power can be relative, it can be absolute, it can be perceived and anticipated. So how can we decipher power? Through China Power, CSIS unpacks the complexity of China's rise by analyzing the key components of Chinese power. What are China's strengths? What are its weaknesses? Does China's rise present a threat or an opportunity? Or both? What questions are you asking? Join the conversation at chinapower.csis.org. The Islamic State of Iraq and Syria, or ISIS, is a group so vicious and unmanageable that Al-Qaeda expelled them in February of 2014. ISIS uses the ever-expanding safe haven straddling the Iraq-Syria border to pursue a regional Sunni caliphate. Originally intent on striking the regime in Damascus, ISIS has more frequently battled an array of Syrian opposition forces who in turn suspect ISIS of colluding with President Assad. Iraqis dominate ISIS leadership, operate robust local and international funding schemes, and lead several thousand foreign fighters from more than 70 countries in their assault on Iraq's Shiite-dominated government. 
What do these dramatic developments mean for an already volatile Middle East in the wider world? Around mid-career, we realize for some reason my colleagues are moving up and I'm not. When you've been working really hard, checking all of those boxes that people tell you to check and you're somehow hitting some type of glass ceiling and you're not entirely sure how to move up. Once you get on the path, how do you find the wherewithal, the resources, the community of folks uh, that can help you to continue to grow yourself and make yourself aware of opportunities? Diversity in our national security is essential. The purpose of our project in diversity and leadership in foreign affairs and international affairs is to bring new voices and diverse perspectives to important discussions in foreign affairs and international affairs writ large. People who come from such a, a wide a range of, of backgrounds, they have language skills, they, they know how to operate interculturally with our counterparts on the other side of the table. We have this rich, untapped potential. How do we make the most of it and really get it into positions that can have an impact? It's a signpost. It lets you know that there are people who come from places like yours, who look like you do, who share certain types of cultural affinity, certain types of struggles. I've seen already that you get better uh, reactions in diplomacy, you get better buy-in when you're trying to move forward with development efforts, and you have people sort of understanding that this might be a model that could work for their countries as well. Okay, we're gonna go ahead and get started with the second part of today's event. Thank you all for sticking around. Um, as Bonnie mentioned, my name is Matthew Funioli. I'm a fellow here at CSIS with the China Power Project and one of the co-authors of the report. Um, as I'm sure most of you have noticed by now, the report is rather long and we know that you won't have had a chance uh, to really fully digest all the material that's in there. So before jumping into our panel discussion, I'm gonna quickly go over some of our key takeaways. Uh, and we do hope that you all have a chance to pick one up, uh, but there is a PDF available online for those who'd rather read it digitally. And the PowerPoint should be working. All right, there we go. Um, so I'd like to start by defining out a little bit what the New Southbound policy is and was it, what it isn't. And I hope that you'll forgive me as I work through this if I start defaulting into just calling it the NSP, because I'm going to say it a lot of times, and we'll probably have that on the panel as well. We did it in the report. I probably cut 10 pages out doing that. Um, at its core, it's a strategy. It's a strategy for Taiwan to strengthen its regional integration. And this is something that's so fundamental to the policy, to the motivations behind the policy, that it actually lent itself quite well to our subtitle which is deepening Taiwan's regional integration. If successful, we can expect to see some short and long-term gains. In the short term, you can see Taiwan strengthening its cultural, economic, and political ties across the region. And over time, as a policy matures, it could serve to establish mechanisms for Taiwan to reduce its political isolation. Now, some detractors have painted the policy as somehow antagonistic toward Beijing, and that's not really fair. That's not a fair characteristic of the policy. What we see with the policy is Taiwan pursuing its own self-interest, and that's something that you would expect any political actor to do, pursue their self-interest. Um, in economics, for instance, we see that a lot of the policies are geared towards economic diversification. There is worry among Taiwan's leaders, not a new worry, obviously, that Taiwan is overly dependent economically on mainland China, and a lot of what the policy is about is working towards uh, addressing that issue. That said, um, although the policy is not supposed to be antagonistic, there are issues that could create friction as the policy is implemented, and that's something that we sort of need to keep an eye on as the policy moves forward.
This is the second definitional part that we're going to discuss, and this is the new in the new southbound policy, which is particularly revealing. Uh, I'm sure many of you are well aware of past southbound or go south policies, uh, and there has been at times a tendency for critics to compare the old with the new, and that is again something that is a little bit unfair. They do share some economic goals, uh, past go south policies, primarily focused on redirecting investment flows away from mainland China and into Southeast Asia. And for a variety of reasons, they, in a lot of ways, fell short of fully achieving those goals. And so there are some similarities here, right? When we look at the new southbound policy, we see an effort to strengthen economic ties and economic agreements across the region, as well as an emphasis on pushing small and medium-sized enterprises into, overseas, into pursuing overseas opportunities. And that last part specifically does have echoes of the past. But what's different? And there is a lot that's different. The Tsai administration has placed a very heavy emphasis on establishing bilateral ties between countries by focusing on relationships with the general publics in the new southbound countries, as well as with uh, executive, business executives and government officials. And the idea here is, through establishing these ties, there's an incremental process through which Taiwan can help to achieve the long-term goals. And we have to keep the long and the short-term uh, in mind as we evaluate the policy. It's easy for Taiwan, the sort of low-hanging fruit, to strengthen its ties in a number of different ways, and we're going to talk about some of those in the panel. We'll go into more depth on them. And the hope is that in time, these can form as a platform for economic diversification and for strengthening and boosting regional integration. OK. So next thing, very important part. The policy has the support of the government, right? This is something that every policy needs. And it's really, really important when we're talking about the new southbound policy because it's so ambitious. In the process of working on this report, uh, I, at least, and I think some of my colleagues also lost track of the amount of agencies and ministries that are involved in the new southbound policy. Uh, and I think that we sort of came to the conclusion, at least in my professional opinion, is that every single agency and every single ministry in Taiwan is in some manner associated with the new southbound policy to varying degrees, but they're all associated with it in some capacity. It's a big policy, right? And big policies need funding. And I'm going to talk a little bit about budget. We have seen a budget increase, but there are some important things that I want to point out before I give some budgetary information, and that'll again be something we expand on in the panel. The big caveat, and something that we've heard come up a number of times, not today but elsewhere, is that although policy implementation began in 2017, the budget for 2017 was set before President Tsai came to power. So 2018 is really the first time in which we've seen a fully funded new southbound policy. And unsurprisingly, that means there has been a budgetary increase from 2017 to 2018, a considerable increase of around 63%. Uh, so the budget for 2017 was 4.45 billion new Taiwan dollars, and that jumped to 7.26 billion new Taiwan dollars in 2018. It's a lot of money. Uh, and that money has been divvied up between the different ministries that are involved in policy implementation. Uh, but that said, our report suggests that more money should be put into the policy. If the goals are going to be achieved, more money is going to have to be spent to achieve those goals. Uh, one of the areas that we sort of noted that we thought was uh, rather curious was that the Ministry of Culture was one of the very, very few uh, ministries that actually received a funding cut uh, in relation to the new southbound policy, which given that part of the policy is about forming cultural ties between countries, was a little bit uh, curious, I guess we could say, and something we hope will be addressed with future fiscal budgets. One of the unique aspects of the policy is that it's rather dynamic. Um, people who have been following it since the beginning know it's changed a lot. Uh, the, what the policy goals are have kind of stayed the same, but the implementation has changed considerably which on one hand, if you are a researcher who has been charged with coming up with a comprehensive report on the new southbound policy can be a little bit difficult. Uh, it's times we were aiming at something of a moving target, but it does mean that Taiwan's leaders have the flexibility to incorporate new elements into the policy as they see fit. 
Importantly, uh, there is considerable overlap between the goals uh, of the policy. Uh, for instance, boosting economic cooperation is facilitated by talent exchange, and we've started to see that play out in some interesting ways. And one sort of very small example of this is there has been a profound effort to attract more inbound students from southbound countries to come and study in Taiwan's universities. And that has been facilitated by the easing of visa regulations, and it's also been supported by uh, stipends for, to pay for students' travel costs and also for their tuition that have, in one hand, come from the government, and on the other hand, come from uh, private enterprises. And on top of that, private enterprises are also contributing to uh, offering internship programs for a lot of students. So what we see with something as small as inbound students, we see cross-ministry coordination and private and public se sector cooperation. And more of that collaboration is going to be needed as the policy moves forward and seeks to achieve some of its more ambitious goals. And the last thing that I would like to leave everyone with is that we are talking about the new southbound policy, but we are still very, very early in the game. Uh, we're, we're not at a point yet where we can fully evaluate the policy. We can't gauge to the, de the degree to which it succeeded in strengthening and boosting Taiwan's re regional integration. And it may be years before we can fully evaluate it. So we need to give the policy time. Um, but we have started to see some early gains, and I'm going to talk quickly about some of those. I'll leave the economic ones uh, to be discussed on the panel. One of the priorities has been to boost inbound tourism. Um, as many of you know, there has been a huge decrease in inbound tourists from mainland China to Taiwan since 2015, and there has been an effort to try to boost inbound tourists from new southbound countries. And Interestingly enough, uh, sort of the struggle of writing a, a publication, all of the tourism data for 2017 was very, very recently released. And so this is a graphic that we just were able to put together, more updated than what you'll find in the report that had to go to publication a few, uh, a few weeks earlier. But what we did see is that in 2017, there was a significant uptick in tourists from New Southbound countries, as marked by the orange line on the graph. That's a good thing. That said, it's nowhere near making up the amount of loss of tourists that affects the tourism industry and the downturn from mainland China. And so much like a lot of what we're seeing with new southbound policy, early promising signs, but there's still a lot of work to be done. The same can be said for uh, looking at inbound students and other aspects of the policy. Uh, in closing, the new southbound policy is something that should be very carefully examined by the countries targeted by Taiwan and also countries further afield like the United States that have a vested interest in supporting Taiwan's efforts to contribute to the peaceful development of Asia. In examining the goals of the new southbound policy, these countries may find that their own interests and objectives overlap with the goals of the southbound policy and they should seek out mutual avenues for mutual gains. Thank you. Great, so we're now going to turn to our discussion. Um, I'll very briefly introduce our panelists. To my immediate right is Derek Mitchell, who is US Ambassador to Myanmar from 2012 to 2016. Um, he is now a senior advisor at the Albright uh, Stonebridge Group. To his right is Dr. Christy Xu, who is director of the Taiwan ASEAN Studies Center at the Zhonghua Institute for Economic Research in Taiwan. And then uh, to her right is Dr. Scott Kennedy, who is a Deputy Director of the Freeman Chair uh, in China Studies and Director of the Project on Chinese Business and Political Economy here at CSIS. So we'll talk a little bit about the new Southbound policy and then move forward, uh, forward to talk about some of the uh, policy recommendations which we uh, discuss in our report. So um, Christy, I'll start with you. How does the new southbound policy fit into President Tsai's broader plan to restructure the economy? And if you could talk a little bit also about the goal, which uh, sometimes is not so explicit, it's a bit subtle, of reducing over-reliance on mainland China as a destination for Taiwan's goods and investment. 
Okay. Um, first of all, um, thank you very much for, ha for having me here to uh, share my thoughts and observation on the new southbound policy with the experts. Um, just to give you a little bit background of uh, the main challenges facing Taiwan in the past in the past years. Um, um, we used to enjoy uh, so-called the miracle growth in the 1970s and 1980s, and however, that growth has run its course. So in the past decade, um, Taiwan has been suffering from a lot of uh, new challenges. For example, in the past decade, um, the average uh, growth rate um, has dropped to less than 3%, and the export growth has been slowing down, and also we see a hollowing out of domestic uh, industries to overseas district. That mainly goes to China and also to uh, the, the Southeast Asian countries. So uh, given these circumstances, when uh, President Tsai um, came to power in May 2016, she has to prioritize and address these long-standing challenges, uh, long-standing challenges. So uh, in the past 20 months, she has, uh, her administration has put a lot of uh, energy and efforts, um, for example, the tax reform, the pension reform, and also the plans to uh, improve infrastructure at home and also to uh, enhance, for example, social safety nets and these kind of things. Uh, you don't hear much because this is more uh, of internal economic plan instead of uh, New South Wales policy, which is more external. And uh, most of all, she has um, committed to um, committed to um, um, promoting industrial transformation that has been relied and based on OEN, ODN manufacturing industry in the past three decades to a new development model that will more focus on services, uh, uh, um, total solution, new technology, and new economy, etc. So um, uh, the new South Bank policy fits well into this larger uh, uh, policy framework in terms that the new uh, uh, South Bank policy focus uh, in particular a few things, uh, a few new area. For example, the new uh, uh, new economy, high value, uh, high value services, and high value uh, 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 agriculture, and also green uh, green uh, technology as well as new uh, energy. So, uh, new South Bank policy is going to play a strategic role in uh, developing, in help developing this kind of new transformation uh, uh, a model uh, and also adoption of this model in international markets. So that is the uh, 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 strate uh, strategic role of New South Bank policy. And in terms of um, how the New South Bank policy is going to help reduce of economic uh, dependence on uh, Chinese market, well, that has, been, um, that has been debated for many years. Uh, because I mean, uh, uh, before before uh, last year, we kind of export forty percent, forty percent directly or indirectly through Hong Kong to a Chinese market. However, that kind of growth has been slowing down. Even uh, back in 2009, we have signed uh, this ECFA agreement with China, which should um, help our export to China. However, our export still um, in China face a lot of competition from our competitors, from uh, Korea, from Japan, and also from uh, the local suppliers. You know, uh, in Chinese, we call it this rise of supply, uh, rise of red supply chain and that China is trying, uh, trying to develop their own supply chain and uh, replacing Taiwan's role. So it is, uh, this it is because of this background that um, Taiwanese firm actually um, turn or redirect their focus from China to other parts of the world, mainly um, Southeast Asian countries, and some even go further to uh, India or Bangladesh in the past year. So this happened actually before uh, the announcement of the new South Bank policy. So uh, the new South Bank policy, as mentioned by uh, our minister, that is, it is never something uh, planned against China, uh, planned against China, uh, and, also, and even well comes um, cooperation with China under the Bell and Road or the New South Bank Policy uh, Initiative. Uh, somehow we do see that um, Taiwan is going to more and more diversify its economy, also trade and investment activities uh, to other parts of the world. You know, some companies in the past year have all, have already thought about uh, investing in Africa, in Latin America. It is ironic because uh, ten years ago, companies move companies uh, move uh, uh, from uh, Latin America. 
uh, countries to a Asia. And now they are thinking about going back to Latin America because that is a less competitive region. So I do think that um, with the uh, New South Wales policy and also the uh, more and more difficulty in Chinese market, Taiwanese company will learn how to diversify themselves. Scott, can you talk a little bit about how the new southbound policy can help to address um, what I know you've talked and written about, one of the biggest problems in the global economy, which is really the growing dominance of China Inc. throughout these, um, these supply chains? Sure, sure. Um, uh, first of all, let me just express my thanks to you, Bonnie, uh, for inviting me to join the project. Uh, I've benefited tremendously. I've learned a ton. Uh, the trip uh, that we took with you and with Derek uh, was amazing. We got to meet Christy and, and many others. Uh, and uh, this is exactly the type of collaboration I love to do, and I really appreciate the opportunity. Uh, with regard to the question, um, uh, the challenges that Christy just mentioned vis-a-vis -vis China that Taiwan faces is the same challenge actually everyone faces. Uh, Taiwan faces it more intensely because of the deep integration of the economies and ex precisely where Taiwan fits in terms of uh, its place in uh, the supply chain and the importance of manufacturing to Taiwan's economy. Those are exactly the places where China is targeting its industrial policy right now. Yeah. So the questions of uh, red supply chain the, it ma don't matter as much, but they're exactly the same types of concerns that you hear in Washington mm -hmm. and in every other capital. Mm -hmm. Uh, and there's big concerns about um, China's um, system, um, not just con taking market share from individual companies in individual places, but affecting um, su overall supply chains, uh, business models, and essentially exporting the inefficiencies of the China Inc. model to everyone else and making it difficult to compete uh, when uh, for companies that operate with tight budget constraints in open environments. Um, and so that is something that, that's a challenge for everyone. And so that is why, uh, as, as Christy pointed out, you're already seeing, uh, because of the changing business environment in China, uh, companies already shifting uh, to elsewhere uh, in the region, uh, actually in some places bringing uh, certain types of jobs home. Uh, so the new southbound policy is not going against the tide, it is going with the tide. Uh, and, 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 that, and, and that's generally what you want governmental policies to do, not go against markets, but to support markets. Uh, and so I think this is something that is particularly acutely felt. Uh, Taiwan has benefited tremendously from cross-strait ties, and I think it can continue to do so. And so the new southbound policy actually in some ways ought to be additional incentives uh, that the Chinese are hearing from places around the world, including the discussions here in Washington about how we ought to uh, adjust the relationship with China. And so in that regard, um, it's, it's something that uh, is specific to Taiwan, but reflective of a broader trend. Great. So Derek, I think one of the most important questions that uh, we are trying to address through this report and, and this project is why is the new southbound policy important to the United States? Why should we pay attention to this strategy? Why is the success of the new southbound policy in American interests? And perhaps you can also address, since uh, Minister Deng uh, himself did draw the um, explicit uh, uh, analogy with the Indo-Pacific, free and open Indo-Pacific, and there's been so much discussion about it. Is there an uh, alignment uh, between the U.S. And, and, and Taiwan and between the new southbound policy and the free and open Indo-Pacific strategy? Right. Well, thank you, Bonnie. And let me just add my appreciation to you for leading this and Matthew for all the work that you've done. Um, and also congratulations on making the IT work, which I think is, uh, which is great for representation of Taiwan IT, probably technology. Also, I used to work here at CSIS, and this is a great cover. Um, yeah. <laughs> you want a cover you can put on your coffee table, and so people want to pick it up. So hopefully you read what's inside, but it's particularly a really great cover, and it's, uh, I want to congratulate you on that. Um, the, now on the topic. Um, the issue of uh, U.S. interests, it, 
This is very important. The one thing I think you learn from today's discussion, from John Dung's excellent presentation, is just how much is being done. Yes. And it's not understood here in Washington just how much is already being done on the new southbound policy. There are many people in Washington that say, this is old wine in new bottles. You know, this is, they tried this in the 90s. They tried this in the past. Nothing new here, and they just summarily dismiss it. And they don't realize just how much emphasis and how comprehensive and broad and interesting this new version is and how timely it is, which I think Scott spoke to when it comes to the economics. This is not something extraordinary and as suggested, I mean, China tends to want to make everything about itself and about politics. When you look at this, this is very natural. This is what, if you look at even the Obama policy on the pivot to Asia, it was not just a pivot to Asia, it was a pivot within Asia to South and Southeast Asia because we understood the dynamism of South and Southeast Asia, how important that region was to our future uh, security and our, and our development. And John showed how Korea is doing it and how India is doing it. It makes absolute sense practically that Taiwan do it. Now, why is it in America's interest that this happened? We have a tremendous interest and long have, uh, we write about this in the report, in, in Taiwan's success. It is a remarkable success story. It's Taiwan's model of development has been a model of development that has led to the so-called Asian miracle, which is not a miracle. It's, it's, it's following very smart policies, starting with agriculture, moving to small industries, moving up the chain, that has led to uh, Asia being the most dynamic region of the world. And Taiwan's been one of those leaders. So it is our, in our interest that Taiwan share that, share their experiences, that it gets others to follow the norms uh, and the values that have underlined, under, uh, underwritten that throughout Asia. Um, and, uh, you know, Asia remains a place that, that has tremendous uh, possibility, but also tremendous challenges. And you don't want to dismiss what 30, 23 and a half million people have done in health, in education, in IT, and all the rest, what they can contribute to continue the progress of Asia. That is in our interest, <clears throat> that Asia continue to progress and to succeed. Our values, of course, are, are also a part of this. Number two, I guess, now I didn't realize that, number two in Freedom House, in uh, democracy in, in Asia, and freedom in Asia, that should matter to us when we see elsewhere in Asia regression along these lines. Um, this is, our values say we want to support uh, a people, uh, a political actor, whatever you want to call them, um, doing, uh, you know, spreading the word and underwriting the norms of business activity, of health, of education, et cetera. It, it, and if they do get involved with a new belt, a one belt, one road, or AIIB, what this is about is not about China, it's about norms. It's about what are the standards by which we want Asia and the world to operate by and Taiwan stands by us. They, they operate according to those norms. We all are not perfect in this regard. <laughs> But we want, I think it matters that, that Taiwan get this right. So we write in this report about how we should be thinking much more strategically, much more systematically on how we could support Taiwan in this effort, how we can partner with Taiwan in this effort in South and Southeast Asia and in, in Australia and New Zealand to uh, try to assist Asia's development in a way that is consistent with our values and interests. Great. And we'll talk a little bit more about that later. But first, I'd I guess I'd like to ask the question, um, which we've already said several times, this is not the first time Taiwan has had a southbound, southward strategy. It goes back to Li Donghui originally. Um, uh, I think there were actually two efforts under him, and then uh, Chang Shui-bian. And uh, initially, when this strategy was announced, or this policy, uh, many people here and elsewhere, I think, sort of rolled their eyes and said, here we go again. Mm -hmm. um, uh, Taiwan's companies go to the mainland in order to make a uh, profit, and uh, they can't be redirected uh, to invest in Southeast Asia. Uh, and of course, that is not the um, a, a correct characterization of the entire policy to begin with. But even if we look at that aspect of it, um, I think that, to some extent, uh, the circumstances have changed. And so maybe, Christy, if you could address 
whether you think that uh, the circumstances are fundam fundamentally different than they've been in the past, in what way that will enable the new southbound policy to be more successful than prior efforts? Um, yes, thank you um, for the question. Um, the the first uh, Go South policy was uh, Go South policy by Taiwan was announced back in 1990s, and then uh, in early 2000, it's um, the second we call it the second uh, Go South a uh, Go South policy announced by President Li Deng Hui. At that time. Um, um, at that time, in the first, uh, okay, the Go South um, policy back in the 1990s, uh, the government did um, encourage a lot of investment together with them. But most, most of the investment are done at that time by state-owned companies, by KMT party-owned companies, by uh, 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 state-owned banks, and therefore they follow the government, they follow the policy. However, they didn't really uh, make their decision to stay at that time. And therefore, uh, in late, uh, in late uh, uh, 90s, uh, we have, for example, the, uh, in, in 1997, 1998, we have this anti-Chinese riots in Indonesia, which drove away a lot of Taiwanese uh, people, Taiwanese um, a company. They never returned back to Indonesia. And also, in uh, late 1990s, um, the China, be, uh, China began to rise and open up its the market. And also, uh, Taiwanese government began to relax a lot of restrictions to allow more uh, trade and more investment. So a lot of these companies staying in Philippines, in Malaysia, in Penang, for example, they all relocate from Southeast Asian countries to uh, to China at that time. So uh, uh, that was the situation, and that is also the judgment that people consider uh, the this Go South Pump policy have been a failure because they didn't really man, uh, make this company stay and stay. Uh, in, in Southeast Asian countries, uh, Southeast Asian countries, and then um, something changed in this region, uh, starting with uh, the integration, integration among the ten ASEAN countries, and also the integration with the neighboring country, the plus, uh, the ASEAN plus one. They are getting more integrated with Korea, with Japan, with uh, China, which makes um, um, this region a much larger uh, market and much larger base for uh, example uh, for a large base for uh, um, manufacturing industry and also of course much larger domestic mar domestic market in terms of goods and in terms of uh, services so at uh, that drive really attract a lot of um, Taiwanese company either from Taiwan to go to Southeast Asia or relocate from China to Southeast Asia because um, China is getting more and more difficult and also China a lot of Taiwanese this company are actually looking inward, uh, looking inward in China instead of looking outward because China's export in the past two decades have been suffering a lot from all kinds of trade remedy, all kind of um, all kind of uh, uh, measures. So uh, a lot of these companies um, uh, stay in uh, Southeast a uh, stay in Southeast Asia. And I have to mention one thing that um, in this regard, Taiwan. Uh, enterprises really work closely with uh, the U.S. policy. Uh, for example, in, uh, in 1995, you uh, broke the ice of your relation with Vietnam, and then a lot of uh, American clients um, invite um, their, su their suppliers, the Taiwanese suppliers, move from China to Vietnam. So a lot of uh, companies went to Vietnam. And then a, a, a few, two, three years ago, a lot of your American clients invite Taiwanese company again to invest in Myanmar to support development of Myanmar and uh, ambassador knows this a lot so um, Taiwanese company actually follow and work closely with the US policies in this region so I think um, both external environment and also the uh, economic performance of this um, Southeast Asia uh, Southeast Asia country have been so impressive in the past decade that this uh, will definitely ensure uh, uh, um, not ensure that um, operations 
operations of Taiwanese company. In particular, we have all these experience, uh, all these uh, experiences of the uh, previous Taishang, the Taiwanese company mm -hmm. there, mm -hmm. and now they have their second generation, and they now know the markets and know the places better. So I think all this promise a much uh, positive, uh, a positive future and environment for uh, Taiwanese business as well as the success of the new southbound policy this time. Let me just add a couple points. Obviously, that's very comprehensive. <clears throat> it's not just, I would say, um, whether the companies go yeah. and what they do, but how they do it that's mm -hmm. going to be important. Uh, and it's what I, I think John talked about or someone talked about, which is, well, John certainly did. So we're going to go and we're going to train workers. We're going to empower local people. We're going to add value. Uh, and I call it investing versus extracting. I mean, they're truly looking, I hope, I mean, this is what it should be, is, and I'm not sure CSR was such a thing in the 90s or, or mm -hmm. you know, 2000s. It's certainly a big deal in the United States now that um, the values in Tell us what CSR is. CSR is corporate social responsibility. Okay. It's corporate governance. It's the way you, you engage, uh, what companies engage in a way that conforms to certain values. Uh, and usually it means you are assisting local populations. You're actually providing it rather than extracting. So I would really encourage Taiwan companies to think in these terms, that if the government is working with companies, it's not just selling, look, our companies can go in and invest there, but we're going to add real value to your, to your countries, real value to, value to your citizens. And that in itself is a selling point. So it's not just the what, but the how, I think, would be very important to have in doing this. Secondly, the, the difference, you know, and I think this is why it excites me much more than it would have 20 years ago, is the people-to-people -people stuff, the cultural stuff. Uh, again, politicizing everything, making it about either economics. I think you get away from that. Taiwan has, you know, a lot of people that have done tremendous things. Talk about health and doctors, IT specialists, young people who are rising in Taiwan. This emphasis on building these relationships. That is going to have much more of a, an impact, I think, and, and really gives Taiwan a profile. Um, and I also think it's just important for the region to understand uh, and to, to build these linkages. And we had that. I think the, the new administration has a Young Southeast Asia Leadership Initiative, which we found was extremely successful. And that kind of thing makes the current iteration, I think, much stronger and smarter than the previous ones. One of the four goals uh, of the new southbound policy guidelines is to encourage industry to adopt a new southbound strategy. So can you talk a bit, um, Scott, about what's being done to achieve this goal? My understanding is that most of the uh, companies from Taiwan that have been participating in uh, going out and investing and operating in uh, Southeast Asia and in India really been more the state-owned companies. And I know uh, Minister Dung did talk about the goal of getting small and medium enterprises. So what, what, what are the challenges here? Sure. Um, that's um, obviously um, the policy, uh, very clear strategy, overall design, uh, implementation is key to make it work well. Otherwise, um, uh, it's not going to support Taiwan's economy in the region uh, the way it, it needs to. Um, most of the transition that we've already seen, even before the policy uh, was uh, announced and being started being implemented, was with sort of um, multinational Taiwanese companies that uh, had operations in China uh, and other parts of the world who already were uh, sensitive to the changing business climate in China and uh, the rising costs of production, uh, regulatory obstacles, and had already begun to move elsewhere with their American, European, Japanese, Korean partners in those supply chains to Southeast Asia, to India, and also started looking for new markets uh, because of the growing uh, demand because of rising wages uh, and spending capacity uh, elsewhere. Um, but what the new southbound policy has been able to do and is, I think, targeted on is, is in addition to uh, state-owned companies, very small, medium-sized Taiwanese companies that aren't as naturally global and as connected as Acer and other uh, famous Taiwanese companies that we're familiar with. And so I think you've got a combination of policy, uh, specific uh, components of the policy that are helping these uh, companies 
So you've got a, uh, a new southbound fund uh, that can provide direct support or credit guarantees for these companies. Uh, you have TITRA, uh, which is the Taiwan External Trade Development Council, uh, which has uh, which facilitates, coordinates, is a handmaiden for local Taiwanese companies to go uh, out uh, abroad. There are, they have 12 offices in the new southbound policy uh, uh, partner countries. Um, they have, uh, over the past year, had a lot of ex exhibitions in the region, uh, in Malaysia, Vietnam, elsewhere, and they've had exhibitions in Taiwan and invited uh, businesses from the region in Taiwan as well, uh, identifying market challenges, helping individual companies, so uh, facilitating internship programs, uh, things of that nature. So very specific, tangible, nitty-gritty types of things, uh, which is, I think, why we saw in the, in the data uh, that Minister Dung showed and that we've seen, uh, that Matthew re reported on uh, as well, uh, increases in, in two-way trade, increases in two-way investment uh, that are starting to pay off, and I think we'll probably see that continue uh, in 2018. Let's get to some of our maybe uh, policy recommendations, and Derek, maybe you can talk a little bit about what the U.S. can do to contribute to the new southbound policy success, and, and then maybe Christy and Scott, you can talk a little bit about what more Taiwan can do. Well, I, I think, first of all, and I, it's in the report as well, I think we need to wake up uh, to the fact that this is something that is in our interest and that we should be thinking about within our government. Uh, I think there are two, two elements, or several elements of that. Um, certainly within the government here, and State Department or AIT or others, really state, uh, they may want to think about how, how to, uh, I mean, think about with our South, the East Asia and the South Asia counterparts, talk about is this in our interest and what do we want to do to assist, and then maybe um, send it to our embassies. I partial to embassies, having been in charge of one. You could do a lot out in the field without having to, to look back to Washington. But think about within these different countries, uh, within different uh, uh, ambassadorships and such. I mean, what can we do to assist Taiwan on the ground in, in sensitive ways? I mean, we know how sensitive this issue is. We know uh, that, that these countries may be hypersensitive to, to, you know, again, the political aspects of this question. We want to keep it uh, within bounds. But, um, you know, are there ways that we can work together culturally on cultural affairs? Um, when I was in Myanmar, I was very fortunate there was an American pianist and there was a Taiwan pianist that at the time were dating and they, they went around the world, they did salons and they, they taught music and they came to Myanmar mm -hmm. and they did events there. It was the U.S. with, you know, it looked like U.S. and Taiwan working together, but it was very informal. And it just like the two, and then they brought a, 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 an orchestra from Taipei. Uh, so in informal ways, just find ways that we can connect at NGO level, at think tank level, at cultural levels. Um, creatively, within each country, what are ways that we can facilitate more interaction between Americans, uh, if we can do that, or at least facilitate Taiwan's entry into some of these countries because we have more assets or more um, ability and more maybe weight in some of these countries than we have in the past. Um, so those are sort of initial thinking on, on how we can. I think we just have to start thinking creatively and recognizing first that this is important to us, that they that Taiwan does have a profile and they do succeed in this effort. And then think about where those lines are that may be a little bit too political, of course, um, so that we, we keep this in um, an appropriate balance for the, for the subject countries, for the host countries. And, and, and I think I would just say um, it is important, as uh, Matthew talked about and also as John Dung talked about, uh, the, I don't think that the United States would see this as in any way an effort to weaken relations between Beijing and Taipei. Um, there is uh, no reason for the United States to promote the new southbound policy as something that causes friction in uh, across strait relations. And just as it's been the new southbound policy has been misunderstood as sort of being a counter to Belt and Road, I think it's also been misunderstood as seeing as a way, and I know many experts in, uh, on mainland China have essentially interpreted this new southbound policy as something that is aimed 
at um, weakening um, and damaging the cross-strait relationship. And that would not be in American interest, and I think it wouldn't be in Taiwan's interest. I was very glad to hear that, um, that John specifically uh, addressed mm -hmm. that uh, in, in his remarks. If there were to be opportunities for Taiwanese companies and mainland Chinese companies to work together in a Belt and Road Initiative, just as the Japanese are talking about on a case-by-case -case basis with certain preconditions, working with uh, Chinese companies uh, to advance the uh, infrastructure projects and the Belt and Road. Um, I think that's all for the good. Um, so that's just speaking as one American citizen, but my guess is that the, uh, the US government would find that that would be beneficial as well, as it promotes economic prosperity, connectivity, um, and uh, peace and stability in the region. So let me move on to some questions from both of you um, about uh, what, what more could Taiwan be doing? Christy? Under the new southbound policy? Under the new southbound policy. Are they, <laughs> um, it, is it a problem, for example, as Matthew talked a little bit uh -huh. about the resources, and it's mm -hmm. really helpful now to have the budget allocation mm -hmm. out there. Mm -hmm. We can see where money is being given. Mm -hmm. um, is it a question of uh, allocating more resources? Is it a question of uh, more uh, scholarships and more things done to improve uh, tourism? Um, mm -hmm. Or are there areas that, um, Matthew mentioned, for example, the Ministry of Culture. Mm -hmm. you know, I have to admit, we were very surprised mm -hmm. when Derek Scott and I went to go see an official at Taiwan's Ministry of Culture. And we mm -hmm. think, as, as John talked about, mm -hmm. Taiwan has a lot of soft power. Yes. Um, yes. So uh, we really thought that the Ministry of Culture would be actively involved in this policy, and we, we learned it is not. You know, yes. Taiwan is great films and artists, and it, so shouldn't this be more of an integral part of the policy? And you know, do you have any other thoughts as to areas where Taiwan could be promoting um, the new southbound policy that it isn't already yeah. doing so? Yeah. yeah, and then, thank you for the question. I'll, I'll address a bit on the soft power Diplo uh, diplomacy or the people-centered people-centered uh, approach because this is something very different and something very new under this new southbound policy and this kind of approach has never exist in the previous one and um, um, I must say that uh, when Taiwan first announced uh, the focus uh, the emphasis of the people-centered approach it was immediately very much welcomed by Southeast Asian countries and uh, because they have similar concepts they have similar uh, a value under their um, uh, integration process. So uh, they very much welcome this uh, center, this people-centered approach because it's less politically less sensitive and also it's uh, widely felt by the whole society. And also this human, uh, this people-centered approach also in Taiwan successfully has successfully mobilized uh, various sector capacity resources in Taiwan uh, society to respond to the policy. So in the past year, we have seen a lot of um, a lot of exchange programs uh, between, uh, for example, our universities, our research institution, our think tanks, our business association, and also our nonprofit organization, and also local governments uh, try to find their counterparts in this country. And uh, for example, just for example, um, um, in terms of uh, city diplomacy, which is something very new to Taiwan, in the past year, uh, we have um, uh, the city government of Kaohsiung, Taichung, Tainan, they all have successfully developed city sister relations with certain uh, counterparts in Vietnam, in Malaysia, in Philippines, and in Jakarta. So I believe this kind of people-centered uh, exchanges will become a very important uh, platform in bridging, in bridging uh, communities, um, communities from Taiwan also in this country. And also, um, it will bring Taiwan closer to people there. So I think that will make um, Taiwan more welcome and uh, getting to know each other better. I have to also mention that um, 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 in terms of promoting soft uh, power uh, diplomacy or people-centered approach, Taiwan has a unique strength compared with other external uh, uh, countries, Japan, China, Korea. And that is the Taishang I already mentioned. And, um, Taishang, 
Uh, the Taiwanese company, Taiwanese business people, they have been everywhere with their family, with their spouse, their ex uh, expatriates for many, many years. And now they have the second generation of Taishang. Uh, most of them were brought up, uh, uh, have been brought up and educated in this country. So they have better understanding of local cultures uh, than their parents. So this kind of network, this kind of networks are now doing something very, very new. Okay, for for example, they focus the young generation focus more on a, a, a digital thing, innovation thing. Uh, um, complementary to uh, their parents who are focused, who focus more in, in, in manufacturing industry. And in addition to that, uh, something is also very uh, unique about Taiwan because back home in Taiwan, we have more, uh, we currently host more, more than 600,000 foreign workers coming from four countries, Malaysia, Indonesia, uh, Vietnam, also Philippines. I think we have the largest number of foreign workers in uh, Northeast, country, Northeast Asian country. And also in Taiwan, uh, you probably don't know that, we, have, we are the home to around 150,000 foreign spouse coming from Southeast Asian countries. And now they have their second generation. So you may expect that um, 30 years from now, we may have a president, uh, a president who has, uh, who has uh, a, 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 the mother coming from Vietnam, most likely, <laughs> or from uh, uh, Indonesia, okay? So I think that kind of a very um, um, a unique and strong social ties, and also uh, uh, social ties uh, um, and uh, human capital will make Taiwan very much welcome and actually make Taiwan an integral part of the society instead of just one of the uh, source of foreign investment or trading companies. I think that's something we can uh, focus and continue to work. Yep. So Scott, you have some terrific recommendations in our report for Taiwan. Maybe you can talk about some of those. Sure. Um, I think uh, the recommendations uh, that, that Derek and Christy mentioned right on the money um, let me mention a couple specific things uh, in the, some things in the report, and then the sort of broader context um, because of, of what I think the long-term major goals are. Um, so, just at the micro level and sort of day-to-day -day things in terms of making this work on, on the economics, um, is there needs to be, and it's already started, but uh, the Taiwan government uh, needs to have deep engagement with Taiwanese industry industry associations, uh, get it, collecting their ideas on figuring out what's most important to them, what are the gaps that government can fill to help them uh, uh, invest abroad, export, uh, be a quality, attractive partners for those that want to invest and do business uh, on the island. Uh, so that level of that sort of regular intensive engagement with industry uh, as policy is made, as policy is executed, I think is is, is really uh, critically important. Uh, and I think that applies not only to Taiwanese businesses, but to American companies, Japanese companies, others, uh, because the, it, this can't just work through embassies in the region. It has to be uh, a network of collaboration. Uh, and, but the Taiwan uh, government can facilitate that, can put up a green light sign for everyone to, to do that uh, uh, individually. Um, I think, secondly, uh, in, the, in these uh, partner uh, countries, uh, I think one of the things that we heard when we were uh, interviewing and things that we've read is, is, um, is that uh, Taiwanese officials uh, and other organizations aren't as present uh, in uh, regional integration discussions in the way that their colleagues in, from Japan uh, and from other countries are. Uh, and that they need to be as present, as vigorous, as engaged. Uh, as one told us, you know, uh, for example, in India, there is a feast in India, a big meal, a banquet, uh, but the, the Taiwanese aren't as present as the others. Uh, and so that kind of uh, level of presence and activism uh, in the region. I think, I guess for me, the long-term issue of this is because I think even though these business issues and things that I emphasize uh, in my contribution to the report are, are very specific and tangible. Uh, it's the long-term issues. I think the, the way Derek framed it is, is exactly right. Is, you know, Taiwan has a model and an experience. It's a modern, liberal, cosmopolitan society that not only that we respect and admire, 
but we want to help encourage elsewhere. And so I think that what is important with the students, vocational training, creating more opportunities for people to live long term uh, in Taiwan are, are, are tremendously important. Uh, one of the things we didn't talk about in the report, but we talked a little bit about, and I think uh, Christy probably could speak to this more, is that there are not a lot of centers of Taiwan studies in Southeast Asia, in South Asia. Mm -hmm. uh, and the, there are lots of centers of China studies, right? Now, it's not to, to say one versus the other, but it's a diverse region that needs to know fully about this, uh, about all the participants in the region. So, and those types of centers of learning create legacies that last over time far beyond any individual business deal or any individual company's activities. Can I just build quickly on, on uh, what Scott said, which I obviously agree with everything, is that this should not just be a US-Taiwan thing. Because it is a matter of norms, et cetera, we should, and I, we, I think we put it in the recommendations, that Japan should be interested in this, Australia should be interested in this, um, you know, we talk about the Quad, whether formally or just individually, those countries have certain values. Um, and I think they would have an interest in facilitating in an informal ways, not talking about politicizing, making it political. This is an affirmative, not a negative thing. This is to help Asia succeed, to help contribute to the stability and security of Asia, to ensure, of course, that uh, the people in Taiwan get the dignity and profile they deserve for what they've achieved, but what they can offer to the rest of the region, which the rest of the region, I think, already is looking to. The, the, the second aspect, which is I'm not certain, when we went there, I couldn't figure out, because I know the two priorities that the, the Taiwan administration has. One is this one, New Southbound. The other you hear about is Asian Silicon Valley. Mm. And you wonder how those can connect to each other in some fashion, yeah. either with some of with the United States as a partner, with others as a partner. Um, I haven't seen the tangent, the, the overlap between that, the strategic thinking um, integrating those two, which might be interesting as this thing proceeds. I can add a bit. Um, um, so the two pillars, and uh, uh, in addition to all these domestic economic policies, there are two pillars. One is the new Southbound policy, which is the most important external economic strategy for Tsai Ing-wen, uh, President Tsai Ing-wen. Another one is uh, the five plus two. Uh, innovative industry and Silicon Valley is just one of them. Mm -hmm. This has um, 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 high value agriculture and also circulate, cir circular, circular economy, etc. So these are the types of industry that are now uh, uh, on top of the trend in the whole region. So I do, we, we are now back at home, I, and they are trying to uh, link these two together. So as I just mentioned that um, the, um, the South, new Southbound policy has the potential to bring, uh, to bring or to develop the new development model in uh, international markets, including uh, the adoption of this five plus, five plus two industry in this region. So this is, uh, this is one thing that probably uh, this, your center can do uh, a further study. And I also have some recommendation for, uh, for, 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 for you. I think Taiwan can be um, a development partner uh, for the U.S., for Australia, for Japan in this region. Uh, for example, um, though the um, uh, U.S. has walked out of the uh, TPP, however, um, however, your concern, your concern, or your attention on um, uh, labor standard in Vietnam remains the same. Yeah, and therefore um, Taiwan has been the largest uh, in Taiwan to get all these Taiwanese company together, employ like like around 1.5 workers in Vietnam. So we always say that we are the third largest employee in Vietnam. So I think in that regard, Taiwan, um, Taiwan. Uh, the U.S., even even EU, because there is one uh, Vietnam EU and uh, FTA, which is going to be implemented anytime soon this year. So uh, we can work together on improving uh, social safety nets. Uh, so sorry, uh, 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 social uh, corporate social responsibility and labor standard in uh, Vietnam, for example. And also, um, Taiwan has been very important investing in uh, 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 the manufacturing industry in less developed country. Myanmar, uh, Cambodia, and also other, and Philippines. I think we can also work together for that. That's great. Um, maybe we'll just uh, take a few minutes, see if there's any questions uh, from the floor before we end. Yes? Joanne? All right. 
Uh, good morning, uh, Joanne Chen from Taiwan. Personally, I would say the new southbound policy is a good neighborhood policy. We need to know our neighbors, not just U.S. Japan. And uh, so uh, I would say it's a good neighborhood policy. It, it doesn't matter when it started, but I'm sure it will continue. And I have a question for uh, Ambassador Mitchell. You were there personally at the first hand of watching the U.S. Obama administration's rebalance and uh, uh, comprehensive engagement policy toward ASEAN country. Can you share some of your experience, some of the most difficult issues or most difficult part of that policy and how you overcame? Thank you. <laughs> well, to be precise, I was in Myanmar for much of the time, <laughs> for about four, four years of that and, and worked uh, that specifically. Um, I mean, the, the, always the hardest thing in government, even if you have the right idea and you have an intention, is distractions, things that, that take your, your focus away. Uh, the resource of time to focus, and then actual money resources and financial resources to put behind your strategy. So I think uh, one of the criticisms or the, the critiques of the so-called pivot or rebalance was where's the beef? Was there really that many, much more in terms of resources put towards it? Um, I would say yes, there was. I mean, I think the Waisili, as I mentioned, Young Southeast Asia Leadership Initiative, which is a lot more attention to Southeast Asia. President Obama went to all the Southeast Asian nations, uh, or all the ASEAN nations, the first to president to have done that. Um, there was really a lot of attention. But you know, you, you get pulled to the Middle East, you get pulled to Afghanistan, you get pulled to other things, and that was, that was a challenge. Uh, and then just sustainability of it gets difficult. Um, you know, we got questions all the time. Well, what happens after Obama leaves? Then what? And if we said, well, if we were President Clinton, we'd have a nice continuity or maybe increase and we don't know if it's someone else. And you can make your own judgments on the current administration. But, um, you know, that's, I think that's the biggest challenge. It was not hard to convince, for instance, the White House of the importance of Asia. This was really, really a, a, a pleasure to be an Asianist and find finally when they talk about the 21st century being an Asian century, that it wasn't just talk. That I went to the White House in the sit room and even before the talk of the pivot, I heard the National Security Advisor, the Deputy National Security Advisor talking about the turn to Asia. We have to do more in Asia. What more can we do in Asia? And it was just music to our ears um, to experience that. Um, you know, coordinating the whole government in that direction, you know, making it strategic, that's always hard. Making the right decisions, uh, ensuring that you do have a, a positive, um, uh, you do the communications well. I think the communications was a little bit lagging on the pivot and therefore it was misunderstood. Um, all of that is, is a challenge, but uh, it was a start. And I think what it was, was exactly what I mentioned with Taiwan and the new southbound policy which is simply a recognition. It was a practical recognition that Asia is going to be more and more important to us in the 21st century. It wasn't about a single power or the rise of China purely. Clearly, that was a component of it because it changes balance of power somewhat. But it was just a fact that Asia was so important to us. We need to pay more attention. And if we didn't get it all done during our administration, we felt every successive administration would recognize the reality and it would have to continue. One more question? Yes, here. Uh, th thank you for the great panel. Oh. Uh, I'm, I'm Sato Shinshata from the Liberty and the Happy Science Group in Japan, which has a connection to the uh, Japanese government. And uh, I think Prime Minister Abe is uh, thinking uh, Taiwan as a very, very important partner. And there are a lot of non-governmental communications, uh, communications uh, between Japan and Taiwan, including uh, Japan-Taiwan uh, Association. Uh, I forgot the name. <laughs> anyway, a uh, big association. Anyway, um, so I wonder uh, what kind of role Japan is expected to play uh, regarding this uh, new policy. Uh, thank you. Do you have thoughts? Yes, yeah, sure. Christine. Yeah, um, um, Taiwan and Japan are natural partners in um, 
Southeast Asia, and that partnership has been going on for years. Uh, for example, uh, in the case of Indonesia, Thailand, Philippines, and now Vietnam and Myanmar, it's always Japanese companies, the large, for example, the large car makers go first, and then they invite their suppliers from Taiwan for auto parts and all these kind of equipment to follow them, to follow suit. So uh, uh, in the past years, um, um, JICA, for example, JICA together with our uh, uh, representative office in a, a number of these countries, some, they will uh, organize, co-organize workshop business matching activities from time to time to have Taiwanese suppliers directly uh, business matching with their uh, 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 Japanese, Japanese suppliers. So I think um, Japan can actually um, uh, play a very important role. Two weeks ago, um, your JTRO and JICA people visit us in Taipei and inviting uh, this time um, Taiwan to invest in Myanmar because Myanmar is now very important in this Indo-Pacific strategy because um, because it's on the uh, on the east side of mm. the in the ocean and, and China is over there and they are talking about having this kind of oil pipelines, right? So uh, uh, the Japanese government has committed to increase investment in Myanmar to ensure that Myanmar will not go further Co uh, further, uh, 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 further to China. So uh, they are inviting Taiwan to be to 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 be supporters to them. So I think that kind of part natural partnership, plus the opportunities for uh, Japan, Taiwan, even U.S. to work together under this new ODA, this high quality infrastructure, can really be something that we can promote in the future. Okay, maybe we'll take one last one if there is one. If not. Um We've had a great session today. Um, I think um, we've all, I, hopefully you will all go away with a better understanding of the new southbound policy. Uh, continue to pay attention to it. We welcome any comments you have on our report. I really want to thank um, uh, Christy for coming all the way from Taipei for our session today and uh, not only you, but all of your colleagues for so patiently answering all of our questions as we visited uh, Taiwan we enjoy and it. <laughs> learned uh, about the new southbound policy. And of course, uh, to Scott and Derek, thank you for your contributions to the report, for joining me in, uh, in our trip to Taiwan. I hope we continue to uh, uh, examine the policy and do our part to help promote uh, its uh, success. Um, thank you to Matthew for your contributions to the report, to my staff and the China Power uh, Project, who are all here today running this event, um, and to all of you for coming. Thanks again. Thank you.